we, uh, today's Palm Sunday. Did you guys know that? Some of you did, some didn't, but it's Palm Sunday. What's that mean? Palm Sunday is the Sunday prior to Passover. It's the, it's the beginning of Passover, the first day of it, and then it culminates with the resurrection. So it, it just really goes Sunday to Sunday, and um, well, it's, it's a wonderful time. So to recognize Jesus. <laughs> The last week is what we're looking at in the Gospel of Mark. The last week of of the life of Christ uh, before going to the cross. And he he has entered Jerusalem for this Passover feast, which is a week long, and it's going to be intense. Um, And again, it lasts Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. It's Sunday to Sunday. And the leaders in Jerusalem are aware of Jesus' presence, especially when he came in riding on the donkey and the crowds were hailing him and they thought, we need to get rid of this guy. You know, tell your disciples not to say anything. If they, and he said, man, if, these, if, if they don't cry out, Hosanna, a blesses you, comes in the name of, if they don't cry out, the rocks are going to cry out. The trees, the, the rock, very rocks are going to cry out to usher in the Messiah. Like, they totally were missing it, the Jewish uh, leaders there in, in Jerusalem. Um, Jesus comes into town. And again, it's, it's picture an outlaw riding into town. You know, the silhouette. You know, he's, he's coming in. And the leaders, the focus is on him. And, and what is he going to do? But he comes in on a donkey. He did not come in on the great horse with the, the charge of the steed and full battle array. No, he came in lowly, as Zechariah 9.9 prophesied, lowly with meekness. He came in offering peace. That would be a king offering peace on a donkey. A king coming to rule and conquer, horse. But he came lowly, right? And he was going to let his life be taken so that others could have life. He was coming to heal the broken world, not just the broken systems of the world. All the broken systems are because there's broken lives and broken minds and broken hearts, right? Because there's a broken relationship with God. So they may have wanted him to come in as a conquering king. They, the people may have wanted him to come in and, and dispose, you know, get rid of Rome and get rid of the corruption in their, in their leadership and the government and so forth. And he, finally, someone who's for the people. But their impression of that would be someone to come in and take external rule and authority and power, right? And, and Jesus was coming in to die for the sins of man, for the brokenness, to redeem the world from its chains of sin and death. So that's Palm Sunday. He came as King of Israel. And we're going to pick it up now in Mark 11 too. That was a couple of weeks ago that we went through that text. It's online if you want to see it. But now we're going to look at Monday. He comes in in the morning. He went back out to Bethany the night before. And he's going to come in Monday morning. And he's going to, uh, on the way in, he's going to have an interaction with a fig tree. And then... He's going to go into the temple, and he's going to spend apparently the whole day around that temple because uh, when evening comes, he departs back out. We don't know all that went on because we only have a few words, but he spent the whole day there, early in the morning till the evening of of Monday. And so, uh, Steve, you would read uh, Mark 11, verse 12 to 21. That'd that'd be great. Now the next day, when they had come up from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from a bar of a tree, he went to see. Perhaps he wanted something more. When he came to it, he found nothing of the use, for it was not the season for face. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat for you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And they would return the tables and money changers and the seats of those who sold to us. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares in the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard him and saw how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When he had come, he went out of the sea. Now, in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the victory dried up from the earth. And Peter remembering said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Thank you, Steve. Father, we ask that you would minister to us this morning, your goodness, your grace, and that you would, you know, minister to us in an awesome way by revealing more of Jesus to us. 
and uh, that we would, we would give you the right place in our lives and that you'd have full authority here, Lord, that you would um, be gracious now as, as I'm just a man who speaks, but Lord, that you would speak and overlook that and that you would uh, touch our hearts, one and all, in the name of Jesus, amen. So here is Monday again, the second day of Passover, and when Jesus judges this fig tree, what do you think his attitude is like? Do you think he's, um, he's angry? You know, when I'm hungry, what happens? You know, don't ask my wife. You know, it's like you get grumpy, hangry, they call it, right? So short-tempered, your fuse is a lot shorter, you're hungry, you're cranky, um, you know, we all experience that. And sometimes parenting is just that simple. Feed him, right? <laughs> feed him and he'll be better, right? Make them sleep. And um, feed them something that makes them sleep. <laughs> but when I'm hungry, I get upset. I don't speak as kindly as I once did. I might be more rash. I may be more, a little quick-tempered. Not so with Jesus. Amen? Not so with Jesus. For me, yeah, but not him. So what's going on with this fig tree and, and him judging this fig tree. I want to talk about it for a minute. This is a unique fig tree. If you put up here, there's a picture of, of a fig tree in my yard. And um, that's my fig tree on the left there. <clears throat> it looks cursed, doesn't it? Um, people will drive in my driveway and they'll be like, what did he do to that? Uh, I, I chopped that thing up last summer uh, or fall. And I thought, this thing's way too tall. And, and I'm, I'm going to see if it can, I'm going to see what happens this year. So hopefully, and that's it currently. I took that picture like two days ago. And um, on the right is a fig tree in Israel. I look, you can look up images of fig trees in Israel. And I'm like, that is not a fig tree. That's like got to be an oak tree or something. Enormous. They're like, they're giant. They're, they were so, like, that's a fig tree? And then you don't see any fruit on its branch, on its leaves, do you? You don't see any fruit. You got to go under the leaves. You got to go lift up the branch and see. You got to get in there to see where the fruit is. And so, I want to talk about this fig tree here in the text. Um, back on the text, please. On the, on the or actually, um, I'm going to quote a couple guys first because here's here's this fig tree. Mine had no figs, no leaves. Uh, the one we saw had leaves. We don't know if there were figs. We'd have to go check it out, right? Um, the fig tree Jesus saw would have looked like the one that was full of leaves. It would have looked like that one, okay? That's the one he saw from afar off. And um, it was full of green leaves. So Hebert, uh, a commentator, he says this, other fig trees in the neighborhood were still without leaves. Uh, but this one was in full foliage, Okay, what's that tell you? It's early. It was an exceptional tree, apparently located in a favored spot so that it was far ahead of other fig trees. It was blossoming ahead of time, got it? In the fig tree, the fruit appears coincident with and sometimes even before the appearance of the leaves. If the leaves alone appear, there will be no fruit that year. Bishop relates the experience of finding a fig tree near the wall of Jerusalem on Good Friday, 1936, which had figs quite large enough to warrant picking. He said for the next decade, it continued to be so. Okay, so he found one that was there, and that was the case. Now, Mark's gospel uh, here adds that it wasn't the time or it wasn't the season for figs in verse 13. It wasn't the season for figs. Now, he, Jesus was hungry, and he was hungry probably because uh, there was a lot emotionally for him to face this Passover week and his crucifixion. He knew what was coming, and um, that would be very difficult. So whatever went on the night before with a time of prayer, rising early to spend time with the Father, don't know, but he in the morning, this word fear for hunger is he's got severe hunger. And, and maybe he was, because when your attention is so wrapped up in something, have you ever skipped a meal? Have you ever lost sleep? I'm assuming Jesus is in a sort of condition like that. And he wakes up, so he sees this fig tree far off. And, oh, it reminds him, you are hungry. Your body, your human body needs nutrition, right? Oh, he sees that, and it reminds him, boom, food. I need, I need to eat. So what happens? Uh, he goes up to it. Now, it wasn't the season. Apparently, it's about six more weeks and, and at the beginning of June, and then they're going to be ready. But clearly, this tree was a strong early starter, right? It's precocious is the word, precocity. It's, it's putting on a big show. It's got leaves 
So there should be fruit coincident with at the same time. At least there should have been the round buds of the beginnings of figs. At least, okay? That's how these trees work. Uh, Jesus saw it from afar, anticipating there's going to be figs on it. He goes up to it, and he found nothing but leaves. Now, doesn't Jesus know everything? Didn't he know there wouldn't be any figs on there? Of course he knows everything. But is he going to always use all his power for his own needs? No, he's going to use it for others. He came to die for others and to serve others, so maybe he chose not to at this time. Nevertheless, that's not a conundrum we need to really talk about. It's a rabbit trail. Underline that. He found nothing but leaves. He found nothing but leaves in verse 13. So he spoke to the tree. Jesus spoke to a a plant, yes, and he cursed it. He said a judgment towards it. Let no one eat from you ever again. His disciples heard it, and then the next morning they're going to pass by in verse 20 and 21, and then they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and it means they're literally watching it. They're actively seeing it wither is what what the verbiage is in that text, verse 20. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away from the roots, not from the branches down like some diseases are, from the roots up, this thing withered out. Okay, interesting. So he pronounced judgment on it and it took place. By the way, this is a unique miracle of Jesus because nowhere else in the gospels does Jesus pronounce a miracle of, of, of judgment. He always healed people. People that were broken, he healed them. People's minds that were uh, you know, messed up, he would, he, would, he would help them and make them whole again and in their right mind. He would cast out evil and demons. He would, um, he would, he would take something of pain and make it whole again. And yet, this is the first time we see in the Gospels where Jesus, he, he pronounced destruction <clears throat> and used a miracle to, to judge. So, by the way, it's just a plant. It's not a person. And it's okay to, to use a plant as an object lesson, <laughs> right? This is an object lesson. God is, is allowing this for a moment that is, speaks to a great, great lesson. It's not upset. He's not hangry. He's doing this because... Uh, there's a lesson involved with it. What's the lesson? Leaves, but no fruit. That's the lesson. Leaves without fruit. It was a judgment against deceptivity, or or, I'm sorry, deceptive and empty profession. A deceptive and empty profession. So this tree was exceptional, wasn't it? It should be producing. It's exceptional. But underneath, there's nothing to be found. The point is, it's got a false profession. It's got appearance without substance. It's a judgment on hypocrisy. That's what the judgment is on. Didn't Jesus have strong words against hypocrisy throughout the Gospels? Absolutely. Strong words against hypocrisy. He was gentle with those who were uh, in deep sin, but they were broken. They were humble. They needed mercy. He didn't yell at them because they needed forgiveness and help. No, he yelled at those who were full of hypocrisy, full of leaves, but no faith, no true faith. And this fig tree often represents, uh, the fig tree, excuse me, and throughout the Bible often represents Israel. It often does, and and the prophets and so forth. So just as this tree, by the way, stood alone ahead of the game for fruitfulness and, and, and vibrancy of the rest of the trees, fig trees, think about that. Were no one, no one of the other fig trees were ready at that point? This tree should have had figs with its leaves. See, Israel was was ahead of it. Israel had the promises of God. They were the nation that was given the the forefathers and all the word of God and the scriptures when no one else did. No one else had the witness that Israel had, right? But also, Israel had all those promises which they should be partaking of, which would make them very fruitful. Many of the promises... We're, we're on that condition that if you obey my law and if you keep my commands, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be fruitful. So they had great promises and they, they had great advantage. And Jesus was very hungry. 
I think that's significant because it's a picture of the heart of God, the heart Jesus has for humanity, the heart he has, especially for Israel as he comes in where he wept over Jerusalem and his heart is beating that he would have them receive their Messiah, but they would not. They were ready to reject and kill the Messiah. His heart for them, he longs for Israel to bear fruit. This barren fig tree becomes an apt picture of what Jesus is facing in Jerusalem. It's got great appearance. It's got all the appearance of fruit. It's got all the appearance of a heart for God. It's a city thumping with religion and sacrifice and worship. There's appearance of holiness when he goes into the temple. There's an appearance of all of that. There's appearance of piety. There's appearance of worship. There's all this show and all this appearance, but underneath there is no real life. Upon inspection, their hearts don't belong to God. And there is nothing to speak of life. It's tragedy, absolute tragedy. And when we look at the cleansing of the temple later, it's even worse than that because they were to be a witness to the Gentile nations, which they completely failed at because they don't have that heart connection and relationship with God. So it's not only a, a, a hindrance upon their, them personally as a nation, but everyone else too. There's a great appearance of these things. No real life underneath. All the religious trappings. But there was a rejection at the very source of what gives life. Did not Jesus say, I am the vine? You are the branches. Abide in me and you'll bear much fruit. That sap, that life source coming from the vine, the trunk, and reach going up to the branches. You can cut a branch off. You can put it on the ground. Will it still have leaves on it? Yes. It's not going to bear fruit ever again. Why? Because it's not connected to to the root, to the vine. Now, Jesus is the offspring, the root. He is the vine. He is the source. And from the root comes the life to bring the root. I like how it rhymes in English. This is the source. I need simple things like that, right? From that root comes that fruit. And if you're not connected to the root, you ain't going to have any fruit. I must ask, though, if Jesus looked under the leaves of my religion, what would he find? Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? Remember when they knew they were naked and they sinned? Remember when they went and hid themselves? And then remember what happened next? They found some leaves. What kind of leaves were they? Oh, they found some fig leaves. And they took these big sticky fig leaves and they sewed them up and they made themselves little bikinis and stuff or whatever out of them. And they covered their shame with fig leaves. They covered their guilt with their own religious rags. Jesus, the Lord, I mean, the Lord appeared to them and said, no, they needed a sacrifice. So the first sacrifice you see in the Bible, slain an animal, the first death you see there, then he took the skin and provided clothing for them. Proper covering. A blood sacrifice. So, if Jesus looked under the leaves of my religion, what would he find? Will he find the fruits of faith or just outward show of religious activity? You can plant yourself in religiosity, moralism. All the leaves will be there. You can have practice. You can have activity. You can have prayers even. You can even have worship. You can have sacrifice. It can look like a life that, that would be full of active religion. You might even call it active, full of faith. It looks like that. But looking under those leaves, there's no real fruit because there would be the wrong source. If a life is planted in religiosity, you are planted in the wrong source, period. But a life planted in Christ, there will be the fruit of real life. What's on the outside should match what's genuine on the inside. We're not perfect, but God's changing us from glory to glory. He's doing a work in our lives, and we're saved by his grace through faith in him, not what we do. It will come naturally, that fruit, through continuous abiding relationship with Jesus. It happens. Look at Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ, how did you receive him? By faith in him and what he did. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Continue walking by faith. Don't start adding religion onto your Christianity. Adding, oh, you know, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to get holy. I'm going to get righteous. I'm going to get his spirit because I prayed enough. You know, like, no. 
That's not the way. It's as you receive. You receive by faith. You receive by his grace. He's given, he's given us salvation. And so our continuous walk in him is by faith in his grace, having been firmly rooted. Look at that. And now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. It, a relationship with God through grace is the best. That's the only way to have one. You can't have a relationship with him outside of that. I mean, I guess you could have a, a bad relationship with him. <laughs> but the way to have a true relationship, a love relationship with the Lord, a personal one, is, is only through his grace. And it's, you're overflowing with gratitude because he's so good. I tell you, it's, it's, it's through his, his goodness that my life changes and bears fruit. Cursing of this fig tree was not rash uh, and, and without, without a great lesson. It was very important. Appearance, but no reality. And the only way to have that reality is to know Jesus. So I put up here, it's real simple. No Jesus, no life. No Jesus, no life. You know, I've seen that bumper sticker, no Jesus, no peace. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. Quite offensive, you know, it's so true. <laughs> no Jesus, no peace, no Jesus. But no Jesus, no life. If you know Jesus, you'll have life. You'll know what life is. But it, if there's N-O, no Jesus, there's certainly going to be no life. And that's what we're looking at here. That's what we're looking at with, with, for the most part, the nation of Israel. So moving in now to this next part where he cleanses the temple in verse 15. Verse 15, Mark 11 through 19, Jesus came to Jerusalem, went into the temple, began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers, seats of those who sold doves. He wouldn't allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. That's the third thing. And the fourth, he taught them. So uh, and he taught them, my house, it is written, my house. I'll get to that. I'll just wait for a sec. There's four things he does when they get into the temple. Okay. They get into the temple, large temple grounds. We'll show a picture of it in a bit here. But um, four things he's going to do in the temple courts. Drive out those who bought and sold. Overturn tables. Uh, the third thing, he's going to stop the traffic. And the fourth thing, teach. Okay? So he's going to stop the buying and selling. Overturn the tables. Stop the traffic at the entrances. And then teach. Four things. Now, I just want us to look back real quick. Chapter 11, verse 11. Same chapter. Look at verse 11. When Jesus went into Jerusalem, this is on the Sunday, Palm Sunday, into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12th. Okay, so backing it up, not Monday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, goes into the temple. What did Jesus do? He looked around at all things. Did he say stuff? Did he do stuff? Not yet. Then he leaves, stays the night in Bethany, come back, comes back the next morning, sees the fig tree, deals with it, goes into the temple, then he acts. Interesting. See, on Sunday, he came as king of Israel. On Monday, he comes as high priest of Israel. And the high priest has full authority over the temple. Full authority. Nothing is allowed unless the high priest says so in that temple. He's going to come as high priest over his temple. Watch what he does. He assumed authority over it. He was surveying it the night before. He already saw the condition of it. And when he was looking at the condition of it on Sunday, <clears throat> he wasn't thinking, wow, you know, this. okay, good. The, the hinges look good. The gates look good. Yep, there's a, yep, they got enough staff over here. Yep, they've got things going on here. Lots of animals, lots of offering. Okay, good. No, no, no. What kind of condition was he looking for? He was looking at the condition of the heart. And it was so awry. It was in a deplorable, horrible condition. The condition was so bad. And I think that may have kept him up at night. We'll see he wasn't worried about the physical structure, but the spiritual condition. In chapter 13, verse 1, he's, he even tells his disciples, see all these stones? They're all going to be thrown down anyway. He's not talking about the structure. When he went into day to Jerusalem, look what he does. Those four things in the temple courts. The purpose of the whole temple was to allow mankind to have interaction with holy God. Sinful man needs to 
be reconciled to a holy God. So sacrifices need to be there. Offering, mediation, all of the symbolism, all of that's going on is for a possible mediation between sinful man and holy God. That's what's supposed to be happening. And the temple in Jerusalem is the central location where this would occur. Prescribed. You weren't allowed to take sacrifices up to random mountains. In fact, this temple is the location where Abraham took Isaac up to. It's the same plot of ground, the threshing floor of Ornan where David purchased it. You know, it's, it's that location. And, and you think, or it could be the Golgotha there as well, where Christ was crucified. But it's those, those hills all, all right there is the point, the mountains of Moriah. And this is the location. You weren't allowed to bring offerings. You weren't allowed to worship somewhere else. So people had to come here. And, and this is central. All eyes on, on Jerusalem, Passover. All eyes on the temple. All eyes down from the temple down to Jesus. What's he going to do this Passover, right? So it's like really focused. Now, if you put up the, the picture of the uh, temple uh, diagrams there, this scene that we're looking at took place in what would be the, the outer court, okay? Actually, can we, uh, so the temple grounds is, is quite large, and um, especially with Herod's temple, all this outer. So you've got just up in here, the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and, and Solomon's porch, and then you've got the brazen altar and so forth, and then there's a partition, and you've got the, the women's court, Israel, the men are all allowed in here. The women are allowed in here. The gate beautiful. And then outside in this area, in this area is the court of the Gentiles. And the next one. So this gives you the idea. It says it here. You've got the Holy of Holies up in here. You've got the sacrifices. But out here, you've got the court of the Gentiles. Okay? So it's all happening in the court of the Gentiles. That's where this interaction, that's where this scene happens, just so you get that picture. It, everybody's allowed in this area. That's the idea. Got it? The Gentiles and all. So uh, it's the section where the, the Gentile worshipers, the Gentiles who want to worship God, they're non-Jewish, it's provided a place for them, right? So he drives out those who bought and sold. Back to the uh, text there. He drives out those who, who bought and sold, verse 15. The word is to cast out. It is to violently throw <laughs> he drove it out, okay? So uh, like, like a, a foreign animal comes into, you know, your house. You drive it out. You get it out, right? It, and it's, it's, a, it's a force. There's a, it also is a word for tearing, okay? Removing it. Driving out those who bought and sold. And it's not the fact that there were transactions occurring. It's not that fact. That people were traveling to Jerusalem from distant places, you know, from um, Persia and from Italy, all over the place, people were traveling for Passover. All the pilgrims were coming in for Passover. And all Gentile worshipers were also coming in for Passover, traveling from all over. Remember in Acts and, and, and all these people from all these locations, right? Well, here, all these people from all these locations are coming in to, and Jerusalem is swollen in size tremendously at this point tents all over the place. And um, people traveling would not necessarily want to bring their, you know, their sheep with them. It's a lot easier to travel without carrying your sacrifice. So isn't it easier to buy one at the temple? Besides, if you bought one at the temple, you can be sure that it met their standards, their quality standards. It wouldn't have the blemish. Because if you brought yours, what if it was even the one you raised for that purpose? It was, you're all serious about it. You bring it, they're like, no. You know, it's hoof doesn't look right or something just because they want your money, right? So it's very convenient and, um, and they're pressured in some ways probably as well to purchase the sacrifice offerings there. It could have been grain, the doves, the animals, and so forth. Also, they, again, assured it was without blemish. Now, they needed to buy something. They couldn't use uh, Roman or Greek coins because they had idols on them. They had pictures of, of Caesar and so forth. They had idols on these, on these coins. So they needed to exchange their coin for the temple coin. They needed to get a temple coin, a shekel or a drachma. I can't remember the name there. And... Um, 
So the high priest, by the way, again, has authority over all of what goes on there. The exchange rates would have been exorbitant because you've got to use temple coin to buy the temple offerings and sacrifices. Wow, it's starting to look a little more like a monopoly, right? Like there's, they've really got it going here. A possible for, uh, opportunity for corruption. The high priest that has authority over it all would allow, yeah, I'll let your bank come in. I'll let your booth be here. They have the authority to say who is and who's not allowed to be in there. And don't you think they're going to pad their pockets and purses of their family when, when yeah, I'll let your, your, your bank come into uh, the temple, the court of the Gentiles and do all the exchanging? Absolutely. You know, just give me 3% or whatever it is. Um, besides the purchasing of the offerings, a temple tax was required for the upkeep of the temple. It was half a shekel for every male 20 and older. Okay, I'm telling you all this because it'll feed right into why Jesus does what he does. He's not, again, arbitrarily coming in going, I don't like the look of this, you know? I don't like that color, flap. Like he's, he's in there doing this because there's so much corruption going on. Now, um, what was I saying about the half a shekel, 20 years and above? That's about two days wage. Uh, who knows what they made it? A week's wage, right? They, they, they can tra- make that transaction anytime they want. Uh, the exchange, set the exchange rate. Um, a side note, by the way, because I, I hear it, this was not a craft fair, this was not a bake sale, this was not a fundraiser for a missions trip, you know, and I, I've heard it. You know, you can't sell this at a church, you can't sell that at a church. These items are for the worship of God at this temple. We totally miss that point. Yes, we should not be monetizing one another in the house of God in the body of Christ. Someone comes in and you want to hawk your Amway gig or some other lame pyramid scheme, don't do it. Do it somewhere else and try not to say you're a Christian when you do it. <laughs> but honestly, we've had to send people out for that like, or to say, don't do that here, right? It's not a place for that. But if someone's doing a craft sale, someone's doing some other fundraiser for the, some social justice cause or missions trip, by all means, by all means, right? they needed to buy things in order to worship. Now, if we were charging cover at the door to come to church, that would be messed up. You see what I'm saying? You know, if, if we we're making you buy your seat or something like this, uh, whatever that is, we, we, don't even, we don't even pass a plate. We've got a box on the side for, for offerings that are out of generosity and love from our hearts. That's where it should be, right? So we can rent this location and et cetera. Uh, but... Here, these exchanges were based on what was necessary for the worship practices of the temple. I think you got that. I'm not going to beat a dead fig tree here anymore. Those who had the privilege to oversee the temple were totally taking advantage of it. And the temple, again, intended for people to meet with God, to see their need for a Savior, to see their need for a Savior. It became horrible, full of personal gain, making money on the worship of God, making money on the worship of God, not okay. So all this activity was ruining the purpose for the temple and those who came to worship were getting probably jaded because of it against God. So all of this enraged Jesus. He was enraged. He had righteous anger, okay? Without sin, anger without sin, a righteous anger. And he was crashing the tables, He didn't harm the doves. He let the doves out. But he was smashing the seats that they sat on. He was throwing tables. And by the way, Jesus was not, um, he was not like the Italians might have painted him, right? You know, just like the real pale, like weakling sort of Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter. He was, he was probably more Arabic looking than anything, right? And he was probably strong. I would assume, being a carpenter in an agrarian culture. <laughs> and so meek and mild or, or strong and wild, Jesus comes in here and crashes it up. And then he sends all those guys out. His authority is, is going out. And people are paying attention. By the way, when Josiah, King Josiah, young King Josiah, just some of you guys at Bible students, remember what happened when they, they cleansed the temple? They were going in to clean it. And when they cleaned it, what did they find? They found a scroll. What's this scroll? It's the word of God. 
right? The inward cleansing going on. I just think that's really interesting. Here's the word of God. Jesus coming into the temple, cleansing the temple, making it right, and cleaning it out. And so he stopped everyone who's carrying wares through the temple. What's that mean? Hawking their stuff, selling stuff. The word wares, it's translated vessels throughout the Bible. It even uses people as a vessel. But it's translated things by which you carry things. People were carrying stuff. So some people were selling stuff maybe, but I think most, most uh, translations look at this or commentators and they say, no, they're just using it as a thoroughfare. So it's a shortcut. You saw how big the temple ground was there and there's entrances. And so it's become a marketplace, a thoroughfare, booze, bartering, selling, all going on. So he probably, I don't know, it doesn't say in the text, disciples go to the gates. Anyone carrying stuff, stop them. No more traffic running around through here. No more of this taking advantage of others and, and all this crooked exchanging and all this stuff. He, he stopped that. He stopped that. It's like the noise and the, the bustle of a marketplace stops this, right? I mean, when they built the temple, were they allowed to carve the stone on temple grounds? No. They had to carve it far off somewhere else and bring it in so that it could be done quietly. The worship of God. Now, Jesus stops all this noise. No more shortcuts coming through here. It was a place to invite people to know a holy God, a just God, gracious God. And there was so much distraction. And think about God's heart, what he would do, what he has done. He would do anything, everything for people to know him. Everything for people to know him. Everything for us to know him. Um, and they're hindering that from people knowing him. And once he stopped it, he taught. And we don't have all the words recorded of what he taught, but we do have verse 17. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Because isn't it written? Haven't you guys read the scriptures? This is Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7, have you not read it? Even them I will bring to my holy mountain. That's where they're at, the temple. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. He's saying all nations can come here to know their creator, the God of all the earth. And I set up, he set up Israel as a nation by which to be a light to the nations, that all nations would come here. But you have made it a den of thieves. You've made the court of the Gentiles, the temple grounds, a den of thieves. The worship of God was to be available to all nations. They took the court of Gentiles and totally corrupted it. And, and, and now it just looks like any other pagan marketplace around the world, probably. It's, it's, it's got the similar feel to it. They were to be a light to the nations. He alone is God. And verse 18 mentions this powerful response to his authority. The scribes and chief priests, those are the two ruling or the two major parties in the Sanhedrin, which is the 70 rulers of Israel, the 70 uh, guys in the government in charge, okay? So the chief priests and the scribes heard what he said. They sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. The evening he came, he went out of the city, summarizing what happened that day. His actions were claiming he had the right and authority over the temple grounds. He had the right and authority. It's like when he saw the fig tree. He made the fig tree. He created fig trees. He's the creator. Does he have not a right to partake of its figs? He created Israel. Doesn't he have a right to come in there and, and see them worshiping God as he, he designed, and as he ordered, and as he instructed? He's blessed them, he's kept them, he's provided for them. Again, on Sunday he came as king of Israel, but Monday he comes as high priest of Israel, and he took the authority of the temple when he did all this. He just grabbed it and took it. And of course, this completely offended those chief priests and scribes actively seeking how they can destroy him. That means his person and his influence. And when the truth of Jesus comes, people can either accept it or they can harden themselves to it 
In other words, they can humbly receive it or they can try to kill it. Get it out, get it away. You know, throughout the New Testament, we're told that our bodies are like a temple. A temple is a house of worship. He says, you made it a den of thieves, robbers. A den is a a hiding place. It's a, it's a gathering of people uh, that are of a criminal activity, evil mind, okay? That's the idea of a den, a den of thieves, a den of robbers, robbing God of his glory. My life, your life was made to be a place of worship to God by his Holy Spirit and truth. Without Jesus, you know what my life is like? It is like a den of thieves. I don't know know what I'm worshiping, where I'm going. I've lost my purpose. Without the Lord Jesus, I am so lost. So true, my life was just like that, a hiding place for sin, a gathering place for that which robs actually from life, that destroys its purpose. But with Jesus as high priest with full authority over my life, again, the body is called a temple throughout the New Testament. With Jesus as high priest over my life, he stops the corruption, he stops all the frantic noise, he stops the greed, he he removes the lying, the jealousy, the coveting, the contrasting things to his character and nature. And, And I think about it sometimes, I'm like, man, how much stuff do I have running through my life? It's like post it at the doors and say, just stop, be still and know that I'm God. Right? All the noise all the worry, all the stress, all the, the things about money and, and bills or whether it's about relationships or whether it's about temptations or questions, all this stuff, anxieties, running around. And I think about that. If my body's this house, what runs through its hallways? What runs through its rooms? And I think, wow, Lord Jesus, cleanse it. Amen. And and I tell you, I'd speak super honest with you. That's what I need, and I need it continually. And it's like I could invite him into some areas, and then, oh, but don't go see this back room or something like that. What's that about? Is he not good? Is he not going to do a good work in our hearts? See, Jesus, when he comes in as priest over my life, he, (laughs) I'm then connected to the source. He takes my life, and like he did with this temple, he turns it inside out. Man, he's turned my life inside out. Praise to God. Like he's, he's done such a work. And, and there were times where I started trying to like add religious stuff onto it and not just be who I am before the Lord and, and accept that. And that's too bad, right? Because the Lord loves me while I'm yet still a sinner. He continues to love me. It's not once I start like looking like Mr. Goody Two Shoes, like then God's going to accept me even more. No, he loves me. His love is unconditional, and I need to be free in his love, and I need to respond to his love by giving over more to him and accepting that I am a child of God. That's my identity now. He takes my life, he turns it inside out, all of it, and he teaches us what true religion is, a relationship with your God, what worship of God is, what a purpose for your life is. You can have identity and meaning. Now, if you put up 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20, if you wanted to turn there, go ahead, 1 Corinthians Uh, Let's just, we'll put both up, but in 619, here's what it says. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your spirit is God's, your body is God's. I'd assume your soul's God's too, right? You belong to him. Did he purchase? Yes. With what price? the price of his blood. And do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He's speaking in this context in Corinthians of sexual immorality. The Holy Spirit is in you. They couldn't connect with God at the physical temple without all of these systems. But because Jesus came, he died and he rose again, the perfect sacrifice, all those animal sacrifices pointing toward him, And since he has come, there's no need for that anymore. There is no need for those temples anymore, the the temple in Jerusalem, excuse me. There's no need for it to be rebuilt. There is no need because God has given us his Holy Spirit. And now, guess what happens? 
The nations were supposed to go there and be able to worship God. And what's Jesus say? He rises from the dead, and he tells, go to all the nations, right? In Acts 1.8, wait in Jerusalem, you will receive power that you may be witnesses of me. So now, in receiving Jesus, he takes this message of reconciliation to God, the worship of God, and in our lives, that's how he takes it, by the way, in the body of Christ, that's us, all those who believe in him, out to all the nations. So it's carrying that temple, the Holy Spirit within it, and the truth, the word of God, out to the nations. I just think that's incredible, by the way. I think that's incredible. And we all are part of that plan. God is on mission. And we are all part of that mission. It doesn't matter if you're a week old in the Lord, or if you're seven years in the Lord, or 27 years in the Lord, we are all part of that mission. To take out that you can be reconciled to God. He's full of loving kindness and you can pray to him and you can worship him and, and he'll clean out your house. That's so awesome. Jesus lovingly, powerfully exposes and rebukes when, when there's things in our lives. And sometimes we need to hear his spirit speak, right? And he denounced things going on in that temple. So Lord, we speak. Rebuke because you love. Discipline because you love. He never stops loving, but he's powerful and he does expose. That's what he does here. He, he, he powerfully exposes and rebukes and he says, no more of that, no more of that. And he has authority. And I say, Lord, have authority, right? What's he doing in that temple? This is what it was made for. That's what he's doing, not all this stuff. You know what, my life, this is what it's made for, to know God, to worship him. I would not know who I am without that. No word anyone. He's our creator. To know God, to love him, to worship him, to, to serve him. That is life. And now you know what you're made for. You're not made for all that junk. Amen? To know our purpose. So you want a clean life? Jesus does that. He washes our guilt, our fear. Let's have communion now.